Today, Islam is a global religion and has been so for centuries. Yet its rise onto the world stage took place in a few dramatic years following the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him, with the rise of the first caliphate, whose rule extended from the Atlantic Ocean to the borders of the Chinese Empire. In this programme, we want to look at the economic, political and social factors behind the rise of that first caliphate. In order to find out about the expansion of Islam in the years after the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the creation of the first caliphate, I went to two great seats of learning, Oxford University and the School of Oriental and African Studies in central London. In Oxford, I interviewed Chris Wickham, Shishel Professor of Medieval History, while at SOAS, I talked to Professor Hugh Kennedy of the Arab Studies Department. Both men have written extensively on the subject at hand. Professor Wickham, what was the world into which the Arab armies entered at the beginning of their conquests? Well, it's a world dominated by two great empires, the Eastern Roman Empire, we often call it the Byzantine Empire, and the Sasanian Empire of Persia. Um, they've been in existence for centuries. Um, the Sasanians come in in Persia in the third century, but Persia's been around since the fifth, sixth century BC. Uh, the Roman Empire's been there since the year dot, literally. Uh, and in the last 50 years, they have been fighting each other. And in the last 20 years before the Arabs come in in the 630s, they've been, they have been fighting each other mortally, as, as you might say. Um, and it's a period, therefore, in which the, the two great superpowers are extraordinarily weak because they're exhausted by this war. Um, and the Arabs have been on the edge of both for centuries. Um, they're settled in the Roman Empire, they're settled on the edge of the Sasanian Empire, and then they're settled just outside in the semi-desert, in what is now, let us say, eastern Syria, eastern Jordan, down the, down the coast of Saudi Arabia, Yemen, um, a lot of them in Yemen. And then, th then there are nomads in the desert Bedouin. The world was uh, a world that was divided between two great and ancient civilizations, each one represented by an empire. The Greco-Roman civilization, represented at this stage by the Byzantine Empire with its capital in Constantinople, ruled over the Eastern Mediterranean, including Egypt and Libya and um, the whole of the Eastern Mediterranean. The contrast with that, and in many ways opposition to that, uh, was the Persian Empire, ruled by a dynasty, named after a dynasty called the Sasanians, who'd been in power in Persia since effectively the 220s, 230s. So it was a dynasty that had been around for some 400 years by the time that the, the Muslims came. And each of these different, um, both these different empires had their own religious identity as well as a political identity and linguistic identity. The, the Christianity of the uh, Byzantine Empire and the Zoroastrian Mazdaism of the uh, uh, of, of the Persian Empire meant that they were religious rivals as well as cultural and military rivals. And the fault lines or the border line between them lay along the what is really now the Iraq-Syria border more or less. In, uh, so cutting the Fertile Crescent, cutting the Middle East in half. And before the Arab armies entered onto the scene they'd fought a fairly uh, horrendous war in which really yeah. they fought each other to a standstill yes. effectively. Yes, there, were the, there was a terrible war that fought, and the way they fought each other to a standstill as you say but there's also something in a way even more destructive going on and that is the recurrent visitations of plague which bubonic plague like the Black Death of, of the later Middle Ages uh, that certainly destroyed many uh, greatly reduced the population. I mean, we don't know exactly, but probably up to anything, up to a third of the population was killed. And it came in recurrent waves. And so we have a society that was, as it were, stressed out by warfare, but I think probably even more stressed out by plague and, and the depopulation that resulted from plague. The Arabs are often portrayed as Bedouin, but it wasn't quite as simple as that, was it? No, it certainly wasn't. I mean, the Bedouin are clearly quite often shock troops. They're, they're good at fighting. Um, but, but in percentage terms, there actually aren't all that many of them. Um, it's 
roughly like now. Um, well, but perhaps the percentage was, was slightly larger. But if 10% of the Arabs are Bedouin, I'd, I'd, I'd be surprised. The Arab takeover, or what we now call the Middle East, and then North, Egypt and North Africa, was not just simply a uh, military conquest, was it? Well, it certainly is a military conquest. Um, in fact, it's probably the fastest military conquest of an area as big as that that there ever has been. Um, in, in 10 years, they got from what is now Libya to what is now Afghanistan. Um, and then in, the, then in the next 100 years, they got from Spain to what is now the border of China and, and the border of India. But it's a conquest that is the establishment of a system that's, that's more novel than they initially thought it would be, I think. Um, they create an empire which certainly draws on Roman traditions, it draws on Persian traditions, and it certainly draws on the expertise of the administrators, the local administrators of Egypt or Syria or what is now Iraq, uh, what, it, what is now Iran. But it's also a, an empire that's held together by religion. It's held together by their religion, by, by, by the, the, the newly developing Islam. Um, but in every place, the Arabs are a tiny minority um, for a very long time, and therefore they have to get buy-in from the local population. Um, and so they create, um, and, it, and it's quite an achievement, they, they create a system that doesn't actually ever have any very serious revolts against it in the, in the early years of the establishment of the Caliphate. The military conquest was important, but even more important in, in the, the medium and long term, as, as if you like, the cultural conquest. We have to distinguish between two distinct processes here. One is conquest, which is a violent and military event. The second is conversion of people to Islam, which is almost entirely peaceful and goes on over four or five centuries. I mean, it's probably not, uh, not until about 11 or 1200 even uh, that the majority a bare majority of the people in, in the Middle East become Muslim. So it's a slow burn. In terms of the majority of the population of these regions, they were Christian and indeed substantial Jewish populations, and they seem to accept Muslim rule. Well, yeah, that's partially because it's not their job. Um, it's the job of the Byzantine army. And so the Byzantine army packs up after the first major battle. The Battle of the Yarmouk, 636, uh, it's right now exactly on the border between Jordan and Syria. Um, and it's a big Byzantine defeat and the Byzantine army melts away and they focus on, on, on defending what is, what is now Turkey. Um, they don't do a very good job at defending Egypt after that. And, but there's a sense of it happens so fast that it, it wouldn't really be realistic for individual cities that don't have any, any tradition of their own militias to, to defend themselves ag against the Arab attack. Yes, that's true, because they were regarded by the Byzantines as, heres as heretics, and therefore they wouldn't have had perhaps that ideological loyalty to the empire that you've got in, in what is now Turkey, the heartlands of the Byzantine Empire, where the people were, uh, were what we call Greek Orthodox and much more... Um, in tune, shall we say, with their rulers. And the same happens in Iran as well, where the uh, Zoroastrian religion was very much the religion of the state and the ruling classes. But probably many more people were Christians and Jews and, and, and other groups within it. So that it's, not, it's not a religious homogeneity there either. Now, one of the things that strikes me about it, I mean, Mohammed obviously uh, people had great gifts, but one of the things he achieved was he managed to create a leadership team. Now, succession is always difficult, yeah. but, and there were some difficulties, but the people who came after Abu Bakr and so on, they had fantastic talent in terms of leadership. I mean, Yes, I think this is true. And the, it's really a fairly small group of leaders, of mostly from Muhammad's tribe of Quraysh, uh, from Mecca, who establish and really take control of the movement, take it almost by the scruff of its neck, take control of the movement and make sure that rather than breaking up after the Prophet's death, which could easily have happened, that they in fact... Uh, organized Muslim armies to go out on these conquests. It was a question of, I think, expand or break up, and they chose expansion, and they organ. And these setting out of these 
sending of these armies and so on, was a very organized process. It, was, it wasn't just all chaos, a sort of whole migration of vast numbers of people in a chaotic way. It was rather a carefully organized uh, series of military campaigns under leaders who were responsible to, as it were, the leadership in Medina and Hejaz. But the Arabs also offered them terms that essentially if they accepted Arab rule, they paid a poll tax, yeah. they would be allowed to continue yeah. on their own ways and their religion would be relatively protected. The most obvious case of that is Jerusalem. Yes, indeed, that's quite true. Um, partly, it's a question of a deal. If you don't defend your city, you can stay and you don't have to worry, you just have to pay this tax. If you do defend your city, we have the right to take away all your property. Um, and since, since they don't have a militia, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, an issue that, that's easily dealt with. Evidently, we're going to give in. But the actual conquest of each city does seem to be, with, with, with one or two exceptions, relatively straightforward and, and relatively unproblematic. Uh, there was a high degree of toleration on conditions. I mean, the, the basically people were offered a bargain, that you submit and acknowledge our authority and you pay taxes. And those two were absolutely essential. In return for that, you can basically carry on your existing life as much as uh, much in the way you've always done. You could have the rights to your churches, uh, rights to your religious uh, celebrations, and uh, rights obviously to your houses and your lands and so on. So it was a fairly simple bargain. And also going, I mean, looking further on into the Golden Age, a respect also for the culture, the knowledge of these societies that it incorporated. Oh yes, I don't think that there can be any doubt about that because it was, this culture was all around them and the, the Muslims were a fairly small minority to start off with. And so they had to reach an accommodation with, with, with the majority. And One thing that is, um, perhaps it's, it's, it's worth bringing out, is the role of Arabic here. And the way in which Arabic becomes such an important language, Arabic, of course, is the language of Quran, it's the language of God, and therefore it was essential to the religious uh, message of the conquerors. What is very striking is the way that the early caliphs, particularly the Umayyad caliphs, Abdul Malik, um, organizes an Arabic reading writing administration that puts up monumental inscriptions, like the one in the Dome of the Rock, the oldest um, Arabic surviving inscription, uh, that uh, mints Arabic coins with Arabic writing on them, uses Arabic in the everyday language of administration. And so it could have been that Arabic w remained the language of religion, a bit like sort of Latin was perhaps in, in, the, in the later medieval, medieval Europe, but everything else went on in, in vernacular languages. But the, um, the Umayyad caliphs really made Arabic not just the language of religion, but the language of administration and hence the language of everyday life. The situation of Christians and Jews, for instance, inside the new caliphate, inside the new uh, Arab uh, empire, how would that contrast, say, with Byzantium itself, the, or what I think would more accurately be called the Roman Empire still, and indeed what was emerging as later called Christendom in, in uh, Western Europe? Um, well, the Arabs are happy to let what they call peoples of the book um, continue and, and live their own lives and, and practice their own religion. The Arabs are certainly not interested in converting people. Uh, in fact, for the first decades at least, maybe, maybe slightly longer of the caliphate, that they're, they're not particularly enthusiastic about such conversions, although plenty, plenty of them happen. Um, and some of, uh, by the 710s, 720s, there are quite a lot of, of, of people who are operating inside the caliphate as, as, as officials uh, who are the, the, the descendants of, of Christians or the, the, or the descendants of Jews, uh, the descendants of Zoroastrians, uh, the descendants of what the Arabs call pagans, though no one's quite sure what they were. Um, so. So there is a very slow conversion process, but it doesn't actually get fast until the 10th century. That's, that's three centuries later. And again, it's not, it's not done in a framework of coercion at all. It's, you know, if you want to, to, to become Muslim, that's fine, but by the 10th century. And by the 10th century, it's quite a fast process. But again, it, 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 it isn't in itself coercive. If you were to travel from France in that period, say the 7th century, the 8th century, to, let's say, Al-Andalus, Toledo, later on uh, Cordoba, what would the contrast be? 
Well, the contrast is is really an eighth century contrast because the because the Arabs and the Berbers conquered Spain in seven eleven, um, but but, but uh, we get accounts of travel in the tenth century, uh, and the accounts of travel that we get in the tenth are Germans going to Cordova, uh, above all Cordova, and being well horrified because it's Muslim rather than Christian, but unwillingly impressed by its complexity. Uh, th th uh, there is, for example, in the 750s, uh, an emissary of the Emperor Otto I, who is based in northern Germany, to Abd al-Rahman, the, the caliph in Cordoba. Um, and the emissary, uh, he's an ambassador, um, is badly chosen, I think, on Otto's part, because he, chose, he chooses a famously ascetic monk who's, who's abbot of Gores, uh, which is near Metz now in, in eastern France. And John of Gores decides with his companions that their task is to, is to convert the, the caliph. Um, and of course, if you go into the caliph's hall in Medina al uh, in in Cordoba and, and try to convert anybody, you're going to get killed straight away. Um, as you would have done if you wanted to convert Otto to, to, to Islam. Um, but they get to Barcelona or somewhere like that, and, um, and they're discussing this. And the following day, the, the, the local ruler calls them in and said, you know we have spies. Um, you're just not going to do that. Um, and, and they get stuck there. That They don't get out of uh, Barcelona or, or, or Valencia or whichever town it is. Um, and it takes them about a year to get to Cordova, by then, which, which gives them time to send messengers back to Otto saying, shall we do this? And get messages back saying, under no circumstances. But the, the whole account of being in that world is an account of people who are just amazed by its sophistication, uh, although hostile because it's, because it's of a different religion. Yes, you would have noticed huge contrasts in uh, the way people lived in cities, uh, the way people had public baths and these sort of civic communities. You'd have also noticed a big contrast in the way people use money in everyday life for buying and selling things that they needed to eat and drink and wear and things like that. Uh, you'd have noticed a lot of that. Um, you'd have noticed an army that was uh, stationed in garrisons and so on. Uh, you'd have noticed, you'd have noticed a public administration that used reading and writing very extensively, as we can still see from the traces of it that are left in the Egyptian papyri, where of course a lot of this material still survives. A lot of these early Arab documents still survive. Was all contact with the, the Near East cut off in that period, or does it continue? Yeah, it continues. It's always possible to do a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Uh, there are there are accounts in every century of people from from England, from France, from Germany, doing pilgrimages of that kind. They, they tell stories about it because it's, because it's a big deal. Well, it was a big deal into the 16th century as well. Um, and, um, and there are almost no periods in which it's difficult. Or, well, no, there are almost no periods in which it's opposed by the Muslim rulers. Uh, perfectly happy for it to occur. They do pilgrimages to Jerusalem too. Um, and there are always boats going through the Mediterranean. It's just that in the 8th century there are certainly fewer boats. Um, th and the east-west links between Italy and the eastern Mediterranean are held up by, by Byzantine boats above all, running from Sicily to the Aegean. And then you can pick up a boat in the Aegean, get it to Cyprus, get it to the, to the, eastern Med to the Levant coast. It's because if you read the stories of, say, Sinbad the Sailor, I mean, yeah. his world of commerce and navigation is the Indian Ocean. And oh, oh absolutely, China. definitely. Europe doesn't really enter into it. No, there's one of the things that's uh, various um, archaeological other discoveries recently uh, made it clear is, is that the, uh, the Indian Ocean commerce is, is a big development of the early Islamic period. Um, there was very little Indian Ocean commerce in, in the period before the coming of Islam from really the... 8th century onwards, say the year 800 onwards, we begin to get, or we get really quite suddenly, this development of uh, Arab ships going to China and, and things like that. And bringing back things like paper, for instance. Yes, bring, though the paper seems to come, the paper idea probably comes over land, but certainly the technology of paper. There is a, an old established story, which historians have typically sort of 
decided to play down in, in you know, and, and question and so on. But I think the evidence stacks up that paper, which is hugely important for the development of writing and culture and, and because it democratizes writing, it makes writing so much cheaper and easier, that paper is imported into the Arab Middle East in the late 8th century by Chinese prisoners of war who bring the technology with them. And it's, it's uh, the evidence from different areas really is, is, is quite impressive on this. Um, it was to the east, it was into Iran, it was into the Indian Ocean, though that's always luxury. Um, and then by the 10th century, there's a very strong uh, trade route from Alexandria, from Egypt, uh, westwards to Tunisia and to Sicily, which is by that time Arab as well, and then beyond that to Spain.